Marcel is interning with us this semester from the Family Resource College at uh, University of Hawaii. She's marvelous. And um, I'm the Education Partnerships Manager at the Humane Society. It's just a fancy title saying that I just sort of spearhead all the education programs at the Humane Society. My background uh, is combined maybe about 27 years in education, but never in the school system because when I was in college, there were just no jobs to be had in education. So I changed my major seven times and ended up with marketing and merchandising, but always wanted to teach. So in the 90s, I purchased a franchise called Future Kids, and we taught children and educators how to use the computer as a tool and to in integrate them, the computers into the classroom. Fast forward, fast forward, fast forward, I decided to work for someone else, and I tried the sales thing and was great at it, but it was really empty. And this job popped up. Education manager at the Hawaiian Humane Society, and I thought, yeah, I like kids and I love animals, so here I am today. If you're here to learn about how animals can connect students to social and emotional skills, you are in the right place. How many of us here own a pet again? Raise your hand. Hi. Yeah, wow, quite a group. How many of us have at least one time in our lives owned a pet? I mean, now or earlier as kids, right? Um, I think a lot of us can probably remember the very first pet we had, yep. And we probably remember uh, when we first lost that pet, when that pa pet passed away, it was a really deep, um, a deep cut in our, in our lives. So these key moments of re our relationship with animals really help to develop a map in our emotions. It helps us develop into stronger and more compassionate people. And we're really hardwired, we're going to learn, to love animals. So today we're going to take a look. I'm trying to find a place to make sure I don't miss my notes, but also see the screen. OK. So today we're going to take a look at why animals play such a great role in developing social and emotional skills. We're going to take a look at how children's behavior towards animals can indicate how they're going to behave later in life. We're also going to look at the animal's connection and cho uh, to children and social emotional learning. And finally, we're going to do a hands-on activity. So I'm hoping to capture your attention strong enough so you'll stay around because that activity is pretty, uh, it's pretty impressive. It was developed by my former intern from last year, Jessica. So I think you're going to enjoy that. So if you want to be the most popular person amongst kids, fill your arms with candy <laughs> or animals. Because once you bring an animal in, you're going to have squeals of delight. There's just something about that animal magnetism that will draw in children. And I have to say, based on the booth that we had, how many of us here visited the booth that we had in the corner? Quite a few of us, OK. We, have an we had animals there to the whole conference, and people were just flocking over to see the animals, not me. Anyway, this, a relationship we've had with animals, we know for sure is at least 12,000 years old. And we know this because in Enya, in 1978, there was an archaeological dig, and they found a human skeleton buried with a six-month-old puppy. And they know those that skeleton is at least 12,000 years old. So that's pretty amazing and important in terms of how we relate to dogs, at least, and mankind. Those of us who have pets know that pets make us healthier. They bring out the best in us. We know that by stroking a pet, we lower our heart rate, our blood pressure, and a study in 1980 concluded that those um, patients who had heart attacks and have a pet versus those who had a heart attack and didn't have a pet live longer. So if you had a pet, you live longer. Pets also prepare our minds to learn. Because as we interact, interact with them, our neurotransmitters, our feel-good hormones are released. Dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, all of these are very important for a healthy mind, plus they play a very important role in enabling that mind to open up 
to learning and feeling safe. And we know, okay, how many of us have a dog in here? Okay, do you, um, now I know not everyone walks their dog because, you know, dogs can, they, they're paper trained and such, but does anyone here walk their dog outside? On leash? Okay, so you're going to get this. Pets get us moving outside, and they also connect us with other people. I live in a condo. Mm -hmm. I have a little dog. Three hours every day, every three hours, I'm downstairs walking my dog along with everybody else in the building, and I know who Opie is, and I know who Cody is, and I know who Gunther is. Ask me what their parents' names are. <laughs> Oh, they're Gunther's mom and dad, <laughs> or Opie's babysitter. You know, I don't really know them, but I know a lot about their lives because we interact and we connect because we have that connection through animals. Okay. All of these natural physiological and psychological occurrences make animals and they position animals to be great connectors to teaching children to be kind and compassionate empathic and responsible. Research has shown that when children are cruel to animals, it's very indicative of something troubling. Many times it could be that there is abuse at home and the, the child is acting out or, or trying to regain power somehow by, by overpowering the pet. Or it could be that they have a mental illness. In any case, when a child shows that, exhibits that kind of behavior, we definitely want to get in some sort of counseling for that, for that child. Here's some, I promise, not too much doom and gloom, but I do think that these are important numbers to share with you. Of those who committed a crime against animals, and these numbers, was, uh, they were pulled in 1970 from a 20-year study by Northeastern University and the MSPCA. They found that of those who committed a crime against animals, 70% had been involved with other violent property Violent, property, drug, and disorderly crimes, 70%. They're five times more likely to commit a violent crime against another human, four times more likely to commit property crime, and three times more likely to be involved in drunken or disorderly contact, um, conduct. This next slide I find most, most uh, concerning. We were privileged, we brought in a gentleman last week who has developed, Phil Arco, and he uh, developed the link. It's a connection between human violence and animal cruelty. And they just concluded a study right after the most recent shooting on the mainland. And it showed of the recent rash of shootings, 43% of those shooters were actively torturing animals. And I don't know you know, the study doesn't conclude how they were as younger children, but it does conclude what they were actively doing. Very troubling. And I think for all of us who are working with youth um, or who have children or grandchildren or whatever, the recent air gun shootings and BB gun shootings, it just sends a really cold chill down our spine because it's way too close to home. It's way too uh, representative of, of what's happening on the mainland. So as I said, not all is uh, doom and gloom. Uh, we do have opportunities to teach our, our uh, youth to be kinder and more compassionate. And before I go any further, how many of you are familiar with this wheel? Oh, not that many. OK, great. So this, this wheel represents the five competencies of social and emotional learning. So I'm just going to read the, um, the competencies first. And as we go through the next slides, I'll give you some examples and I'll define it a little further. So starting from this, um, this sector, we have self-awareness. Then it goes to self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision making. And when we put all these together, we have what we are calling a socially and emotionally competent person. So let's look at self-awareness. Does anyone, some, I saw a few hands go up. Who can define self-awareness for me? Oh, shy. OK. Oh, I saw a hand. Yes. Hi. <coughs> um, I think um, this is something that I spend a lot of time on with my lessons with, with children. Mm -hmm. um, it's their ability to understand themselves, or to understand uh, their, their 
the, the effect of their behavior on others is part of it. Okay. It's part of it, and it's just, it's, an, it's the ability of them, of children to be able to um, take the, another person's perspective, for example, the ability for them to step into the shoes of another person. Okay, you're, you're kind of jumping ahead, oh, but okay. I think those are good. No, those are good. The so to, be, to know who they what, are. Yeah, and what their actions do to other people. Okay, so the... Um, the, the wheel is actually, it defines it as recognizing, it's real, real simple, recognizing oneself, strengths, emotions, values, limitations. So really understanding who we are and really having to be present to be able to understand those. So in working with, um, with animals, this one is, is fairly simple. It, oops, it comes up quite frequently. Uh, we, we know that students already naturally gravitate towards animals and they're curious. They're also naturally nurturing to animals. Generally speaking, they're very nurturing. Who went to the keynote speaker yesterday morning? I think it was Roots of, Roots of, com, Roots of Empathy, right? So they, in that case, what happened in that class? They took a baby, right? And they had the, the youth nurture the baby for uh, a long period of time, and it really brought out their nurturing instincts. So when we have animals, it's, it sort of works the same way. When we can have the children nurture, we teach them how to be kind, how to be responsible to this animal, and we encourage that behavior and we praise them for that, we start to develop values in them, that empathic, that compassionate and kind value within the students. Also, another thing that's really interesting is that for some reason, Students will often look in a, in a pet's face and they'll say, oh, I think he feels sad. And I'll think to myself, oh, he does? And yeah, I think somebody hurt his feelings just a little while ago. They start to see what they're feeling in the pet's face. So that's really interesting to me. All right, if we look at self-management, um, this, is, this is really... Simple. Does anyone want to guess at this one? It's really managing your emotions to reach your goals. And what I want to do here is share with you a story. There was a school in Metropolitan Honolulu. Uh, the fifth grade teachers came to me, and they were really, really concerned. Sorry if you heard this story at my booth. But um, they were concerned because moving up from fourth grade to fifth grade was going to be 18 behaviorally challenged students really challenged, like kids didn't want to go on the playground to play because of these 18 children. They didn't, teachers would say they would jump on the tables, really challenged. And so these fifth grade teachers are worried because they lost their, uh, their vice principal and their counselor. And they're thinking, oh wow, this is gonna be, this is gonna be really difficult. So they did some research and they saw that pets can calm and diffuse uh, emotional tension. So they came and they said, we wanna set up pet visitation at our school. And I said, well, that would be nice, you know, but I think you need a little bit of lessons in there, right? Some education in there. So we came up with this, uh, a, a decision that they would implement the first chapter in our compassion and responsibility education curriculum. It's a free curriculum we offer that has character development. They would implement that first chapter, which is about kindness, and we would bring pets in 10 minutes per classroom twice a week. Three months it was supposed to be, only three months. So successful, it's still going on today, three years later, and starting in January, we're gonna go school-wide. And what really triggered off the fact that it, was, that it was a success is the ringleader, or the most behaviorally challenged um, student, one day, they were in the group, and Ron, I don't know if any of you came by our booth and met Ron and Athena and Buddha Buddy with the bird, but anyway, Ron and Athena were in this class, and all of a sudden, Athena just started. He's like, Arr. and Athena's really calm. And so Ron looked over, and the boy said, I didn't do nothing. I didn't do nothing, mister. So Ron said, oh, he goes, well, you know, that's between you and Athena, but come, come over here. The boy was kind of nervous, and Ron goes, you know what? I think Athena needs a treat because something got her startled. Would you please give her a treat? So the boy was kind of suspicious, but he gave Athena a treat. And then she took it. 
Athena likes treats. <laughs> so then he said, here, here's another treat. Why don't you see if you can get Athena to go down? If you say Athena down, let's see what she'll do. Hold the treat out. So he did. And he said, Athena down. Athena went down like magic. And Ron said, treat her, treat her. So he gave her the treat. So that developed into a relationship. Each week when they would go through, this boy would learn a little bit more about positive reinforcement. Pretty magical. And he also learned that Athena at one time was abandoned. Nobody wanted Athena. She was mistreated. And look at Athena today. She's well loved. She's a star. She brings joy to classrooms and hospitals. That boy ended up at the end of the school year to be I don't want to say a model student, but he was helping the teacher with the whiteboards and emptying, you know, I don't know, the trash or something. She was, he was always helping the teacher. So the teachers love our program. Can animals teach self-management? You betcha. Social awareness, developing empathy, being aware of other people's feelings. It's funny because it seems like kids just tend to shed their emotional walls when they have animals. You bring an animal, it's like, oh my gosh, right? And even if they were troubled, they go down there and they want to interact and get super, super excited. And, you know, when I go in front, I, our, we speak to all grades, but our primary target is middle and high school. And the reason is because they're social changers and they can really develop and, and, and make things happen. If I go in front of an assembly of kids and I say, so, you know, if you were out in school and you saw one of your schoolmates maybe teasing or mistreating someone, what would you do? Oh, miss, I don't, I don't really know. Uh, would you report them? Mm, I don't know. They're kind of awkward about that. Well, but what if you're in school grounds and you saw someone mistreating an animal? <gasps> Miss, that's wrong. You never, ever mistreat animals. They know this. They know this. It's hardwired. They know that that's not good. So, we have many programs that develop empathy and understanding. We're going to get into that in a little bit. Relationship skills. Um, a lot of us raise our hands. How many of us owned a pet as a child? Okay, a lot of us. Right? And we probably were very close to our pet because there's something about the little kid in the family and the pet. They're sort of on the same level. They have to depend on everybody for everything. And, and they're, they're vulnerable, right? So they naturally form this partnership, this, this bond. And that develops, and that develops into one of the most long-lasting relationship models for us humans. Staggering statistic that I just heard again last week from Phil Arco. More children in the United States will grow, up, will grow up with a family pet than a live at home father. Pretty staggering. And shows the importance that how we treat animals is going to shape us later on. Okay, so. That kind of leads, you know, a lot of the students, because they've had pets, they, um, they'll call us. We get hundreds of students every year saying, Miss, I have to do volunteer, or Miss, I have to do a service project, or I need service hours, and I want to help animals. So I want to share with you some of the items that we will have students do. What I really want is my students to be motivated to learn. Show me that I can make a difference. If only my students could see that what they learn is relevant. Help me to feel good about myself. I want my students to be positive contributors in and out of class. Partnering with the Humane Society allowed us the opportunity to create a project and a more authentic learning opportunity for our students with a topic that would really engage them. 
by bringing in various projects in the different content areas, students were forced to become problem solvers. They had a task and they identified a problem and needed to create a product to solve it. This was also important to them because it was within their own community. Animals inspire us to be here. Students were very inspired by this project. Basically, we give presentations to the kids to teach them about kindness and animal welfare. By teaching them how to be kind to animals, they learn how to be kind to people. I wanted to do something to give back because I thought what Humane Society does is really, really important to our society. I think that by interacting with these little children, it's easier for me to show kindness and also smile more when I'm interacting with my peers. I want lessons that are interesting, fun, and relevant to my life. I think the biggest thing was how much I really love helping athletes and being there to you know, do it in any way that I can. The Hawaiian Humane Society is just about pet adoption and learning how to care for your pets. But it's really about making a difference, the differences that you can see. It's about educating and informing others in our community. What we just looked at were two big examples of how students can make a difference. They can do things simple, things like drives and papers and PowerPoint presentations, but when we take them over the top, like Campbell High School, I talk about animal welfare, I talk about issues. In this case, the students came to me because they were concerned that we were no longer picking up strays. And they said, we have too many strays in Eva Beach. The mayor has to release the money. And I said, no more money. Let's think outside the box. What can you do to reduce the strays? And they said, I don't know. Educate? Ha! Ah. So they put on that big fair. The CAD department did ID tags, and the, um, the art department did bowls, did dog bowls, and the writing department. I mean, they just did everything collaboratively, and it became so successful that this is truly a sustainable model. They're entering their fourth outreach, um, outreach, outreach fair this coming January. So it's, it's pretty amazing. And then we're there. We offer microchips on site and we have, oh, I did it again. Sorry about that. We're there as well and we're offering microchips on site and um, it's, it's quite amazing. The second girls, the second girls, the second set of girls are part of this youth to cakey mentoring. Oh, I lost a word. Youth to cakey mentoring. So we have something we call Tales of Kindness. It's a presentation that we do to the elementary schools as assemblies. And we tell students, I'm gonna borrow your star. We share with students that every living creature has a star in them. And that the star gets a little dim when you stub your toe or somebody hurts your feet your feelings, and it gets really, really dark when you accidentally hurt someone else. But on the other side, your star can get bright when good things happen, like you have side pain laugh with your friends at school, or you get a favorite flavor of bubble gum, and it gets really bright when you make other people feel good. Then we take them through a series of skits. See that new kid over there? He looks funny. Let's go make fun of him. Mm. I don't know, he looks kind of lonely. I want to go be his friend. Yes. And we go back and forth with these skits. Well, what we did with those two girls is they wanted to make a difference. They wanted to not only help animals, but they wanted to help people. So we trained them to give that presentation, them, and they brought in four other students. And they went after school to all the A plus partners that we had in their vicinity. They're from McKinley. And they visited. And they educated more than 1,100 students that one school year after school. Powerful, and guess what else? Not only did they educate the students, they became role models for all those strong character traits. Really, really awesome. Other programs we have, okay, so we have assemblies, we have the free curriculum, oh, there's the mentoring word. Uh, we have service learning training. Uh, we go out, uh, we have classes at our shelter. They're $25, we scholarship anyone that can afford it. But more importantly, when a school, a public school, especially a Title I school wants to do this, we'll take our class out and teach them what issues animals face and let's brainstorm, how can you help them? How can you help these animals? And we put that together. And finally, we have student contests. So that's enough about the Humane Society. 
because I can answer a lot of questions later. But what I want to do now is to take you through an activity. This I have to read. Okay, see this dog? Can you see his face really well? Yeah. Okay, so I want you, uh, I'm gonna share with you that this dog came to our shelter as a lost stray. Does everyone know what a lost stray is? A stray is an animal that comes to us with no form of ID. If they have ID, then they're owned. But if they have no ID, then they're stray. So he came in with no ID, and he's waiting to join a family again. Look in his face and identify some of the emotions that you think he's feeling. Grab that yellow paper in front of you. Hopefully you have a pen, because I forgot to bring pens with me. Um, and let's take 15 seconds to jot down. Those of you who don't have a paper, if you can um, either move up to a table or there's actually, actually up to seats. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. One, two, three. Oh, does she need them back there? Is she part of the class? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so another 10 seconds to write down any emotions you think that dog is feeling. Maybe um, if you were in the dog's shoes, you know, what emotions would you be feeling? Okay, and then now I want you to write in one sentence what you think that animal's story is. Any way you want to interpret that, what do you think in one sentence this animal's story is? I don't want to give you an example because I'll plant a seed. Okay. Five, four, three, two, one. Am I loud enough? Okay. Okay. Now you're going to partner up with somebody next to you. So, two, two, two. Two, two. So I think maybe you and she can partner up. Yeah? Okay. And two, 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 two. I think same thing with you. One, the two in the middle will be partners. Okay, so we're all partnering up. All right, so now what we're going to do is... We're going to have a written conversation with one another. So you pick whatever paper you want, put the other paper on the side. And then I want you to th um, think about the following questions and write about any of them. How would you feel if you were lost? How would you feel if you were lost and you were not able to communicate where you lived? How do you think this animal feels? What would you do if you were lost? And what can this animal, this dog here, do for himself, herself, himself? We're gonna take a minute to write down your thoughts about any of the questions. And then in one minute, we're going to pass the paper to your partner, and they're going to continue the conversation. Your partner in one minute will respond to whatever your thoughts are that you put down. So you have another 30 seconds. OK, so now your partner, just so that we're on the same wavelength, your partner is going to continue the conversation that you've started, starting now. One more minute. Here are some of the questions, one more time, in case you forgot what some of them are. Um, think of, uh, let's see, how would you feel if you were lost? How do you think this animal feels? What would you do if you were lost? What can this dog do for him or herself? I think one minute is too long. I think 30 seconds is better. Oh, it's one minute. Okay, switch off. This time it's going to be, oh, can I do 30 seconds? Okay, 30 seconds, go. You're just adding, you're just adding more to the story. You're starting to expand on this story. You're letting your minds go. If you were this dog, how is he feeling? 
you know, where, where did he come from? How did he land here? Um, what is he thinking? What is he wondering? Okay, switch one more time. Okay, and the last thing I want us to do now is I want to group up in fours or sixes. Um, before we headline it, I want to share with you that the animal was adopted. And you can see right now, looks quite different with his new owner, um, but they're so happy. So now I want you to take that dialogue that you just developed, and I want you to give a headline to it. And I want you to also, in that headline, express what this animal must be, fe must be feeling, or how you would like, how you would feel if you were reunited with your family. And finally, the last thing is our raft. So um, we want to wrap up and also raft role audience format topic. So we want to together come up with a way to explain how this animal became lost and how this animal can be prevented from becoming lost later. And then you're going to discuss as a writer. We're not going to actually do this together. This is a, a, a definitely a great writing activity for a high school, secondary school. But you're going to talk about how you can help the animals by being an activist for animals and what to do with this information. Now, what we normally do with this activity, we've tried it out a couple of times with the students, and they really get into it. We do it at the shelter. And they go and they pick an animal from one of our kennels or from the cat house. And they sit with them for a few minutes. And they stroke them. And they pet them. And they kind of have a little conversation with them. And they read the little card, because every intake card that we have on the kennels, it states, how did that animal come? Owner surrender, stray. Right? It's basically one or the other. And then they sit there, and they, they, they get connected with the animal. And then they come up with these stories. And when they connect and they understand how this animal must feel at this time in their life, and they think, wow, what if I became separated from my family and I had no way of finding them? There's that empathy, right? And then there's also a desire to have a solution. I don't want this to happen to any other animals. And that's when at that point I say, you know, I know many of you here want to help animals at the shelter. And I think that's noble. It's wonderful. We get 23,000 animals a year, 65 animals a day on our doorstep, no matter what day of the year it is. That's a lot. But there's 480,000 animals that are out in the communities. What if you could prevent those 480 from landing in the safety net of the Hawaiian Humane Society. So we all tie it together. Emotions, empathy, and then action. What can I do? Can I do that big outreach event? Could I, there's all those feral cats right next to my school. Could I set a trap and humanely bring them in and have them spayed and neuter and be a caregiver? Could I do this? Could I do that? Can I do an art show and have a, have a pet like, what is that? Silent adoption event, you know, for all these pets that I sculpt out. What can I do to help and make a difference? And that's how it all rose together. And when you have a student that really, really connects and wants to nurture and protect not only that animal, but the animals on the island, you have someone that has social and emotional skills. They know then that they can take those same skills and help humans, because animals are really an extension of us. They understand that. So what I'm going to do now is um, I wanted to allow at least 15 minutes for questions and answers before I, I mean, I have other things I can go into. But, um, and I kind of did part of it before class started. Lost it again. What kind of questions do you have when it comes to social and emotional learning? Yes. You know, I don't have the curriculum with me, but I have soft copies. I should have thought of bringing that with me. Okay. No, 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 yeah, no, no, yeah. So we have, um, the curriculum is written for pre-reader, uh, pre um, elementary, and then secondary. This was written before I came on board, 
and it was written with the assumption that teachers would integrate this into their, into their classroom. It's just to give you a sense of the age, it was written for Hiccups 3. So it's a while ago, it's not, we haven't aligned it to Common Core, primarily because what I'm hearing from, this, from the educators is we don't have time to integrate into our class. Our classes, our class time is super full. Um, the people that have been participating mostly in the, on, on that curriculum side have been um, youth programs where they have the leadership groups, learn it, and then teach it to the younger kids. Uh, what we've done instead since I came on board is develop these into presentations. So Tales of Kindness is basically chapter one. Uh, the responsibility is the animal awareness, the animal welfare um, class that we give. So, um, but I am happy. I'd be thrilled to share it with anyone that wants it. So, Do we have to email you? Yes, you can email me. Actually, you know, I had a sign-in sheet. Oh, it's on our sign-in sheet on our booth. Maybe we can just circulate a yellow paper. Do we have extra yellow paper? Is there anyone that has extra yellow paper? All gone? Okay. So um, on this paper, if you are interested in having me send anything, you can put your name, email, and what you would like for me to send. Okay, thank you so much. What other questions? Um, yes? Do you have this, um, these programs on the Oh, you know, we, the Hawaiian Humane Society is Oahu, yeah? It's Oahu based. But you're on Kauai, was, yeah? Oh, on the Big Island. So I would um, contact the Big, are you Konas? Hilo side. So I would contact the Humane Society over there, let them know that you were at this workshop. Um, and if there's anything that kind of tweaked your mind, everything's online. You know, what we offer, if you go to hawaiianhumane.org slash education, we have a whole list of our offerings. And then they can always contact me if they want to do something, if they have, if they have the manpower. We're very fortunate on Oahu, the, the um, board of directors realizes that we truly are an education and advocacy organization. So I'm one of few in the nation, or we're one of few in the nation that has more than one full-time educator. Most humane societies and ASPC, um, SPCAs will have one part-time educator. We have three now, so we're really lucky. Yeah, we're really, really fortunate. What, was, uh, what piqued your interest? Yeah, um, yeah, the anti-bullying and, sure. Because we talked about teachers are really busy with the curriculum mm -hmm. and the enrichment classes and mm -hmm. not interfere with your Right, 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 right. You know, another thing I didn't touch on here when we talk about relationship skills, um, the next unit that we're developing now is um, nonverbal communication. Because when you talk about social awareness, you need to understand language, right? And um, animals, and we teach dog bite prevention, we teach children to speak, we call it dog ease, basically read dog body language. And then we start to say, hey, is there any similarity between the confident aggressive and another human type of body movement? And then they start to see there's many similarities between dog posture and human posture. And then they become even more sensitive to human body language. So it's, it's quite powerful. Um, but yeah, we're developing that next. And definitely have them contact me if they have questions. Uh, do you have Kamaina kids at your school? OK. I was going to say they do take out our program to the Big Island and Maui. Anything else? Any other questions? Is there any question that you feel was unanswered by coming here? Is there anything that you wish? Try to cover as much as I could without. This is the last, obviously, you all know this, last session of a two day conference. I didn't want to overtax you. We could go on for hours on what we do. How many of you are from Oahu? A number of you. If I, um, if I offered a workshop at our shelter, say, in late spring of this coming year, would you be interested? Maybe, maybe. On, um, probably on anything that you find of interest here. I mean, like, what, did, what really piqued your interest? Is it, is it the service side? Is it the curriculum side? 
you know, because we can really go into detail and have some workshops done for that. If you're Otter Island, you're welcome to come as well, but it's just, you know, kind of far, yeah. Um, we normally have um, what we call self-guided tours, um, but right now, I don't know if you know this, we're under construction. So all field trips, because of safety, have been on, um, are on hold until probably late spring. Call back. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you.